everyone. Welcome back and thank you for joining our online online CME live today from Glen Eagles Hospital, Kota Kinabalu. My name is Lucy and today we have Dr. Damalinga Mutia, our orthopedic, arthroscopic sports and joint reconstructive surgeon to share with us on knee replacement. Before we start, allow me to brief you a little of Dr. Dharma background. Dr. Dharma Lingamutia hails from Malacca and is a graduate from the University of Malaya. He obtained his surgical fellowship from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh in 1999. Apart from being trained in general orthopedics, he has special advanced training in hand and microsurgery, orthopedic trauma, joint replacements, and arthroscopic surgeries of the upper and lower limb. He has AO fellowships in orthopedic trauma surgery from University of Basel, Uni Switzerland, and he was the first Malaysia fellow to do a fellowship in knee and upper limb surgeries at the North Sydney Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Centre, which is affiliated to Australian Institute of Muscular Skeletal Research. His surgical interest includes general orthopedics, hand surgery, reconstructive surgery, joint replacements, spot injury, and arthroscopic surgeries of upper and lower limbs. If you have any question for Dr. Dharma, please send it to the comment section or you can WhatsApp your question to the phone number as stated below and Dr. Dharma will try to answer your question towards the end of our session. Without further ado, I will pass this session now to Dr. Dharma. Good evening, Dr. Dharma. Uh, <coughs> good, uh, thank you very much, Lucy, for the kind introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, respected doctors. Uh, I'm supposed to talk about hip and knee replacement, but I decided to just talk about knee replacement today because it's such a big topic. And uh, I'll try to stick to general information of knee replacement because a lot of it are very technical. Uh, the reason why I chose this topic is so that the general practitioners know when to refer a patient for a total knee replacement and also uh, they, they know a little bit about total knee and its benefit to their patients. All right? So now total knee has been, in, uh, people have been doing total knee for the last maybe 100 years but it really really took off 50 years ago and since then it has really really evolved and it's still evolving. So my topic today is 50 years of knee arthroplasty. Okay, next. Okay, this is my patient. Uh, she underwent bilateral knee replacement. Uh, we have this facility in uh, Glen Eagle where we can do a long cassette x-ray. So we can do x-ray in, uh, that includes the hip, knee and the ankle. So you can see the alignment uh, accurately while the patient is standing. All right. So I do this for most of the patients. Okay, next. Okay, I do. Okay, what is total knee? The definition is very simple. It's either a total or partial uh, knee arthroplasty. Sorry, it's either total or partial replacement of the articulation surfaces, the articulating surfaces with artificial components. So we have three articulation surfaces. One is the patellofemoral joint. Number two is the medial compartment or we call it the femoral tibial joint and the lateral compartment femoral tibial joint. So you can replace all three compartments then it's called total knee replacement or you can just replace the femoral tibial joint which most of the time we do, we don't replace the patella and or you can just do one compartment either the medial, lateral or the patella then it becomes unicondylar knee replacement or patellofemoral re knee replacement. This is just a definition. So a little bit of the history of knee replacement. People have been trying to do joint replacements for the last 100 years but most of it really fails and results are very catastrophic. People, people don't understand the, uh, the science behind uh, knee replacement then. The first real implant was in the 1960s. It's really a condylar knee implant. Condylar means the shape of the implant looks like your original knee, you know, it's just condylar, right? But uh, prior to that, whenever they do knee replacement, they do what we call hinge knee. That means there is a hinge, like your door hinge. And 
this always result in catastrophic failure because they cannot fix it well so it become loose and also of course a lot of patient end up with infection and why it become loose because when you use a constrained knee this is called a constrained knee there's a lot of stress at the bone cement interface and the implant become loose okay so the current designs are actually surface replacing surface it just replaces the surface they are condylar that means like a knee shaped they are anatomical very conforming and congruous and all this was revolutionized further by introduction of bone cement for fixation so the first bone cement was actually approved by FDA in 1971 that made knee replacement even better uh, like I said knee replacement still evolving better designs are coming up newer polyethylene they can last very long uh, and uh, of course there are new things like navigation computer assistant robotics and uh, etc so millions of people have undergone knee replacement in fact 1.5 million knee replacements are done worldwide per year and the biggest market in the world is in the United States that's why most of the knee implants are designed and marketed from the United States. Uh, in UK, the number of knee replacements is 100,000 knee replacements a year. In Malaysia, probably it's about five to 10,000 per year. So as, you, as our population grows older, the number of knee replacements will start going up further and further. And probably one day we might be doing 100,000 knee replacements a year. Okay, so who are the pioneers of knee replacement? Actually, the real pioneer is John Insall. We call him the father of knee surgery. He worked in uh, New York City in, the, in a hospital called Hospital for Special Surgery. And his colleague, Mr. Dr. Chitaranjan Ranawat from India, Peter Walker, Alan English and Bernstein. These are the real pioneers of knee replacement. They started in 1970 by designing duo condylar. Duo condylar means two condyles or unicondylar knee designs uh, and the initial knee replacement they always spare the posterior crucial ligament so that's why it's called crucial sparing but later in 1974 they, they came up with a new technique where they can sacrifice the crucial ligament and the new design is called posterior stabilized knee and uh, it was actually invented by John Insaw. Okay. So now the current implants are either cruciate retaining or cruciate sparing and some surgeons they only do cruciate retaining and some surgeons like me always do cruciate sacrificing. There are, there are reasons why we do this is either the way we are trained or we get good result with what we do. So both techniques are equally effective, there is no difference, it's just a surgeon's preference but the implants are totally different. All right? So uh, in UK too, another guy called Frank Gaston, he also introduced uh, duocondylar knee uh, uh, for TK, uh, TKR in 1968. Okay. So this is the milestones in knee replacement. Uh, hinge knee in 1958, first condylar knee by Gunston in 1968, duocondylar knee by Insol and colleagues 1971, total condylar knee posterior stabilized 1978. Uh, then in 1980 they came out with uncemented knee that means it's porous coated no cement involved just press fit and screws and 1990s they started uh, doing knee replacement with computer assistance and 2006 uh, some surgeons start using robots to do knee replacement so this is a typical knee implant uh, this is a posterior stabilized knee you can see uh, okay, posterior stabilized knee, it looks like this. Okay, there is a box which is we call a cam, and the tibia, uh, the tibia, pl the, pl the, the plastic tray has got a post to engage into the cam. Okay, so this is a posterior stabilized knee. There is a reason why they do this, it's because at 70 degree, the cam will the post will engage into the cam and it will cause the femur to roll back. So it improves your flexion and also reduces the contact stress on the polyethylene. So basically we want the polyethylene to last long, as long as possible. 
so you want to reduce the wear and tear so these are the small small things they they evolve to make the knee replacement uh, last longer and better flexion and better function etc so you just see, this is just illustration how the cam works uh, the post and the cam works in a ps replaced knee this is a cruciate retaining prosthesis there is no post there is no cam you can see the plastic is a bit flatter as compared to the ps knee all right whether i choose a ps knee or cruciate retaining knee is uh, whether a surgeon chooses a ps knee or cr knee is all depends on his expertise and his preference uh, actually the long term result of both the knees are equal so you don't have to worry about what you're going to choose for the patient like the surgeon decide okay you can see the tray here this tray is where the 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 plastic tray is not locked it can rotate it's called a mobile bearing whereas in the picture there is actually a locked uh, polyethylene that means the plastic is locked into the tibial tray okay actually there's no difference in the clinical outcome it's just that theoretically uh, a, a, a rotating platform is supposed to have lesser wear and better to be used in a younger patient who's going to have a longer lifespan so like i said these are the components of the knee okay so why we do knee arthroplasty there is no absolute indication remember there's no absolute indication it's all relative so if the patient come with pain they have tried everything tried medication tried acupuncture whatever still pain pain affects the quality of life every day taking lots of medicine then he can consider knee replacement number 2 is stiffness that means you cannot bend beyond 90 for most of our activities we just need 87 degree of flexion but if some patients who can't get more than 87 degree of flexion then they can consider knee replacement we may be able to get more than 90 degree of flexion post surgery number 3 is deformity either in the coronal plane like varus valgus or in the a uh, sagittal plane where they cannot extend the knee they get fixed flexion deformity all this can be corrected with knee arthroplasty knee instability a very unstable knee which is cannot be corrected with ligament reconstruction you can do a knee replacement putting in a constrained knee or semi constrained knee or hinge knee you can get the knee to be stable okay and last but not least reversal of arthrodesis that means the knee is fused for whatever reason in the past you had tuberculosis of the knee or whatever and your knee is completely stiff you can actually convert it into a knee replacement and you can get some motion of course you also can do knee replacement in patients with tumors around the knee but you need to resect the tumor and you can reconstruct it with a knee replacement so like i tell you there is no absolute indication it's just relative and the idea of knee replacement is to improve the quality of life nothing else it is not a life and that matter is just for quality of life if you want to be active pain free then you do knee replacement so what's the aim of knee replacement is actually for pain relief correct deformity and stiffness improve function restore your active lifestyle and we always try for long term survival of the implant so we try to do in a older patient but sometimes we have to do in a younger patient if the indications are right but in the younger patient there's always a risk that they may end up with revision in the future but with the newer implants newer plastic newer design some of these implant can really last maybe 20 to 25 even 30 years so that's what we aim for to improve the quality of life so we try our best to avoid revision from whatever the cost so if you look at people's knee eh, in general there is no standard you can have a neutrally aligned knee you can have a slight varus knee or valgus knee and in fact 80% of people both their knees will have the same alignment if you have valgus knee both knees will be in valgus in 80% or neutral knee 80% will be neutral but you'll be surprised that 50 uh, 20 uh, 20% of people one knee got a different alignment and the second knee different line uh, different alignment so this is 20% okay and also 30% of people have varus knee and 20% of people valgus knee so if you see a people a person with valgus knee varus knee neutral knee it's just a variation all right 
just like high. So you see, these are the all the variation you see when you when you see people in general. You have normal knee, you got bow legged knee, you got knock knees. All right. So it's all a variation. There's nothing pathological about them. So we consider this normal. But sometimes you get from neutral, you become bow legged. Nah, that is a varus deformity. Or from neutral, you become vulgus knock knee. That is a pathology. So, when we do a knee replacement, we always uh, want to align the implants in uh, in anatomical alignment. Okay. So to understand this, I just give you a small uh, diagram. You can see here there are three lines here. The center line that passes through the symphysis pubis to the ground is called a vertical axis. That is the mechanical axis of your body. Okay. When you stand, your center of gravity passes through here. Okay. And then there is a second line is called the mechanical axis. This is, this is the weight bearing of that particular limb. It passes through the center of the hip to the center of the knee to the center of the ankle. And the last line you can see on your right is the anatomical axis of your femur. If you look at your femur, it is actually 6 degree valgus to your mechanical axis or 9 degree valgus to your vertical axis. So when we do a knee replacement, the current concept that we follow is we cut the bone 90 degree to the mechanical axis. So we want 90 degree to the mechanical axis so that the implant lasts long. The stress is equally distributed, not more onto one side and uh, we want to prolong the survival of the implant. All right? So these three lines are very important for orthopedic surgeons when they do knee replacement. And you can see, okay, I go back to this. So most of the knee replacement that I do, I will try to use the mechanical alignment. I, I will try to aim for a joint line that is neutral to the mechanical alignment. That means when I, when I finish my knee replacement, when I do an x-ray, you can see the joint line is a bit oblique. It's a bit oblique. That is three degree valgus to your vertical axis. That means your joint line is not really parallel to the floor. Okay, but this is the insole concept. But of course, there are other concepts like anatomical alignment where you put the implant in three degree varus. Okay, so that the joint line becomes parallel to the ground. And there's a newer technique called kinematic alignment where the joint line is restored just like before your knee became arthritic. That means go back to your pre-arthritic native knee. And uh, this, uh, this is called a true knee resurfacing and it's very patient specific. You need patient specific implants, you need patient specific instrumentation and it's a pure bone procedure. That means we don't do any soft tissue release and, uh, and uh, you get automatic soft tissue balancing. It's basically a 3D reconstruction of your knee. Okay, it's a bit hard to accept, but this is how your joint actually looks like. Your knee is actually three degree varus. You can see everybody got a three degree varus knee. You can see, but when we do the cut, we cut it ninety, so we get a ninety degree flex, uh, ninety degree perpendicular to your mechanical axis. Okay, so this is all orthopedic uh, concept. So, who are the patients who normally see me for knee replacement? Majority of the patients are primary osteoarthritis. That means you, as you age, you get arthritis, and it's actually genetically determined. If your mother has arthritis, you probably will have knee arthritis of uh, knee arthritis, especially in women. Second group is rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, post-traumatic arthritis, gout, crystal arthritis, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. I've seen quite a lot where the one part of the condyle of tibia plateau just dies off. Uh, it's like a infarct. Just like you get heart attack, you get a bone attack and they become very painful and they don't get better with any medication. So the solution is a knee replacement. Sports related uh, injuries, other arthropathies, hemophilia, all these are can be indication for knee replacement. As long as the knee is painful, deformed, you can do knee replacement. But majority of the patient, primary osteoarthritis, majority. So you can replace unicondylar, bicondylar or total, including the patellofemoral joint. 
So all components are actually surface replacement. You don't just chop off the whole joint, it's just surface resection. So what is a primary knee? Primary knee is you do a first surgery for a simple uncomplicated knee arthritis and we use primary knee implants which are like the one I showed you. Of course, if the primary knee implants fail for whatever reason, either infection, loosening due to aseptic causes, fracture, peri periprostatic fracture, whatever reason, then we do revision. And for revision, the principle is the same but you need a special set of implants to address the bone loss, the ligamentous balancing, etc. Right? And lastly, we try our best not to use a hinge prosthesis, but if you have to use, we use it in a patient with neuromuscular instability. I've done one in the last five years for a polio patient. Uh, this one just will stabilize the knee or special revision cases with extensive bone loss or and uh, soft tissue uh, deficiency or in tumors. So you can see this patient, the left knee has been operated but the right knee hasn't been operated. You can see the obvious difference. She's very happy with the right left knee. Now she's here for the left knee, a uh, right knee, sorry. So she's got various deformities, she's got a bit of fixed flexion deformity. All this will be corrected quite easy. It's just a soft tissue balancing. So this is a pre-op x-ray. This is another patient who had a difficult primary. She came very late, so we have to do a like a revision. Okay, we have to use special implant to address the bone loss. So you see, I have to put wedges and I have to put stem to distribute the stress. Okay, you don't want the patient to reach this stage. So if you want simple primary knee, you must send the patient early. Okay, so this is a hinge prosthesis. There is a hinge in the middle. So it's very very constrained, it doesn't allow rotation, it doesn't allow abduction, it doesn't allow adduction, it just allows flexion extension. So you can imagine if you have a very constrained implant, it's going to put a lot of stress at the bone cement or bone uh, implant interface and it's going to become loose. That's why we try not to use this implant unless we have to. Okay, So this is the, what we call a, a constrained implant. Primary knee unconstrained. That means you can rotate, you can abda, you can ada, you can flex, extend. So the stress on the plastic is minimized, minimized. So it can last longer. Okay, this is a tumor prosthesis where they have resected the distal part of the femur. So once you have dis dis uh, resected the whole distal part of femur, there is no joint. So you have to actually create a joint for them. So you just go through the tibia and hinge it because all the ligaments will be dysfunctional. So you have to hinge it. So I, I just going to talk a little bit about the materials we use in total knee. The femoral component is femoral component is cobalt chrome. Why we choose cobalt chrome? It's very hard to machine, but it's fantastic. It's really hard, smooth. You cannot scratch, so you can. The wear rate on the plastic is really minimized. Okay, so cobalt chrome and. There is a one company from uh, Smith Nephew, they have a oxenium. This is oxenium. Basically, it's a, it's a metal alloy, but the surface is ceramic. The surface is ceramic, and the surface is called zirconium oxide, and it's harder than your cobalt chrome. So, theoretically, this, the wear rate of this on the plastic is much lower than cobalt chrome on plus uh, on your polyethylene but the difference is so small that people still stick to cobalt on plastic the reason is this is very expensive just to get little bit of extra benefit you're not going to waste another extra 5000 so still cobalt chrome on polyethylene is the most popular right okay now the tibial component the tibial component is cobalt chrome or titanium base plate and you have, you have this either a rotating platform or a fixed. The plastic is fixed. It's locked into the tibial tray. There are, ma there are many methods of locking. Different companies got different locking mechanism. And it's modular. That means next time, in 10 years time, if your plastic has worn out, you can just go on and take out the plastic and replace it with a new plastic. So that's why it's modular. So modular is good. Okay. Those days, in 1970, they used just plastic, just thick plastic, bang it inside. Uh, but it doesn't, so it doesn't have the versatility of a modular implant. 
And last but not least, your patella. Your patella is dome shape. It's just a plastic surface replacement. So the polyethylene is the most amazing thing. Currently, we are using ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, vitamin E treated to reduce oxidative free radical uh, formations. When you get free radicals, the plastic can wear off faster. So the current plastic is really low uh, friction, uh, low coefficient of friction, can last even 15 to 25 years. Okay, so this is the oxygenium knee. This is the same one I was just talking to you. Okay, this is how the patella. The patella is dome shape. You know why it's dome shape? They have tried all kinds of shape over the last 30 years. Finally, they settled on dome and they, 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 they cement it with three packs into the bone with real small holes. And this is how the patella engages on the artificial knee. And this same patella can also... Uh, you can even leave your native patella and your native patella, most of the new implants, the flange can accommodate your native patella or replace patella. So we call it patella friendly implant. So how we fix the knee? We always use cement, okay? Uh, because that's the gold standard and the revision rate for cemented knee is about 2% in 10 years. That means if I do 100 knees today, in 10 years time, maybe only 2 out of the 100 will require a revision. Okay, now in, in Western countries, they are trying press fit, that means no cement. No cement means you have to have a plasma spray here or porous coated. After you have fixed it, bone will grow and lock it. But the failure rate with the cementless implant is 4 to 6 percent. So it's not so popular, but people are still trying to improve the design and maybe the future is cementless. Okay, so current prosthetic design. Okay, you can, you, as you know, there are many, many companies selling knee replacements. Stryker, Zimmer, Smith & Nephew, Johnson & Johnson, Korean companies, Chinese companies, German companies. But the design, the prosthetic design are common to almost all of them. Okay, they actually copy each other. Okay. And all are surface replacement and mostly for primary knee is unconstrained where the plastic is not constrained. That means the patient can move in all direction. We only use semi-constrained or constrained knee for ligamentous incompetency. That means if your medial collateral ligament is very lax, if you just do a primary knee unconstrained, the patient will say, hey, why my knee feel very unstable? So a constrained knee is where the plastic is deeper the leaping is deeper, this post is even longer to engage into the camp, okay? And uh, of course, uh, you require special instrumentation for minimal bone cut, okay? So the fe femoral component, this is your femoral component, okay? We have the condyles and then we have a flange for patella tracking, this flange, all right? Uh, we got a camp for the post, okay? And multiple sizes, it comes in multiple sizes. So during surgery, we know which size to use. So the inventory is huge. We got many, many sizes and we choose the right size. And uh, some, some of the companies sell uh, gender specific. That means for women, different implant, for men, different implant. Because women, their Q angle for patella tracking is higher. So some companies have a gender specific knee. Uh, for female, most of the time it's right or uh, you can use, uh, it's, is side specific that means right implant is for right left implant for left you cannot use the other way around okay so and some companies sell what they call high flexion knee that means you can get a bit of extra flexion about 10 degree uh, that is by just increasing the thickness of the posterior condyle it will increase the offset and increases the rollback of the femur and it does increase a little bit of the flexion but it's more for marketing actually the actual clinical result, you don't really get much different from your primary knee. Okay, so you can see how it's designed. So the flange is for patella tracking and they make the flange as thin as possible so that you don't overstuff the anterior compartment. All right, you can see the cam, the post. Okay, the tibial component is always the same, you know, front loading, you load the, the, the plastic from the front, multiple sizes too. And 
sometimes you put a size 5 femur but you can only put size 3 tibia and it allows you to mismatch actually so you can mismatch the femur and tibia and still be okay and tibia is always uh, universal but the new company they're selling right and left okay the the plastic can be fixed or mobile okay sometimes we use stems wedges sleeves for revision and for bone loss I, I already talked to you about polyethylene. No? All right, this is front loading locking uh, plastic. This is mobile tray, and this is site specific left or right because the the lateral plateau is smaller than the medial, so you got right or left. All right, so actually, all this will increase your number of implants that need to be in the OT during surgery. All right, okay, uh, mobile bearing. So mobile bearing, like I told you, theoretically it reduces wear and to, supposed to prolong survival, but in actual fact it doesn't. So I used to use a lot of mobile bearing, but now I've gone back to fixed bearing. All right. This is the Oxford uh, Unicondyler knee, very popular in UK. Uh, it's for arthritis of one compartment. In fact, 40% of people have only arthritis of one compartment. So theoretically, you're just supposed to just replace one compartment. But there are a lot of criteria you have to follow before you can do this. The ACL must be competent. The other compartment must be free of any arthritis. And this surgery is technically more challenging than your total knee. And the failure rate is higher in an uh, incompetent hand. So you need special training to do this. Once you get hold of it, yeah, you can do a lot of this. So to, uh, cement and the poly has revolutionized total knee replacement. So these are the companies that sell all these knee reply and they got all these funny names beautiful names like selling cars you know and uh, okay so i always use zimmer dupuy johnson or sometimes me and nephew i've done biomed Vanguard before all right so this is a uh, smith nephew expensive uh, zirconium okay now a lot of, a lot of my patients ask hey, do you do computer uh, knee replacement no i don't do because you need the cost is higher you need to have a lot of patient volume and now it's not so popular the popularity has gone down only some surgeons are still doing but i i'm sure it will become popular again computer assisted so basically it's a 3d sensor technology where you put pins in the patient's bone and you send electromagnetic in, uh, pulses it will tell you your knee position your hip position your ankle position and it will tell you accurate will guide you to cut the bones accurately without virus or vulgus uh, cuts all right so that's the benefit but in clean the functional outcome the clinical outcome you may get a full fat cuts okay but the functional outcome this most of the time is the same as whether you do our conventional knee replacement all right so maybe you'll become popular again it was very popular in 2000 okay and then there's a new concept called patient specific instrumentation where you have to do CT scan before the operation and then they, the lab will create in cutting instrument based on your anatomy and then send to OT and we do the operation very expensive and then we have robotics robotics basically you go into a CT scan do a 3d imaging you put in the you put in the pictures into the computer and then you fit it into the computer uh, into the robot and the robot will do the bone cuts okay but it's very very expensive not practical at all now it's just done in teaching centers just for experiments okay so this is navigation navigation yeah you just need a you, you have to put four pins two pins in the femur two pins in the tibia and uh, they got receiver and then the electromagnetic receiver and this will be connected to your computer and tell you how to cut okay this is how you show on the computer and this is robotic meco is okay so what are the principles the principles of knee replacement is you must put the components in anatomical placement you have to restore the mechanical and rotatory axis you most important you have to balance the soft tissue in flexion and extension you must fix the implant well if not it become loose and patient will come back for revision and another very important is patella tracking a lot of failure is due to patella problem so when a patient come to me for knee replacement preoperatively for me it's very important if they have diabetes to really get their diabetes control 
Never do totally replacement with the sugar of 10, 20. That is asking for trouble because you are going to get it infected and the patient will curse you for life. They will need many, many operations. So optimize the medical condition, individualize the investigation, pre-operative investigation, echo, chest x-ray, etc. And then of course I have to assess the knee, I have to I have to record the virus deformity, virus deformity, the range of motion, the ligament laxity, etc. And then I do a pre-op x-ray, standing AP, lateral merchant and long cassette to see the virus hanger. And before the night before surgery, I'll give what we call preemptive analgesia, anti-inflammatory, tramadol, paracetamol, lyrica to block all the pain receptors before we we actually cut the patient. And this has shown to really reduce the pain post -op. Uh, one hour before surgery, normally I'll give IV transcendamic acid to reduce the blood loss. So this is how you see the deformity when they stand is accentuated. Okay, pre-op x-ray, long cassette x-ray. In the OT, patient will be on supine, antibiotic, one dose only before operation. No antibiotic after operation because it doesn't work. The most important dose is one dose before operation. Anesthesia can be general spinal epidural combination, depends on what the anesthetist want to give. Uh, I always use tonique, but I don't squeeze out the blood. I've done without tonique, very messy, but some surgeons love to do it without tonique. Okay, now approach, many, many approach, midline, midwasters, subwasters, okay. Okay, I'll just show you some pictures, you see? Uh, midwasters, sub, this is subwasters. The one I always do is the third line, uh, the second line from the right is trivector. I just just cut across the vastus medialis so their quadricep tendon is not disturbed. Okay, so these are the approaches to the knee. We flip the patella. If you cannot flip the patella, you can always snip the quadricep like that. You can you'll be able to flip the patella. If you still cannot flip the patella, you can do a tibial osteotomy. The knee will be exposed. Okay, this is how the knee looks like after the patella has been flipped. And then we do the, uh, we take out the ACL, the meniscus, then we do bone cuts. The bone cuts is called measured resection. And then all we are aiming to do, we want to create an extension gap and an flexion gap that is equal. All right? We remove all the osteophytes, we balance the soft tissue, size the implant. Patella re re replacement only done is the patella is severely degenerated. If not, most of the time we don't do. And then we do a trial implant. And we check the ligament balance in flexion, in extension. We check the patella tracking. We are happy. Then we cement the actual implant. Close the close the wound with a drain. Some surgeon don't put drain. All right. This is how the cut looks like. Okay. This is how the cut looks like after everything. Okay. And this is how it should look in flexion, ninety degree, and extension. This gap must be rectangular both, and they must be equal in flexion. If you don't get this, your knee is not balanced. Patient may complain of pain, instability, blah blah. Okay. Okay. Post op analgesia. My anesthetist here love to give peripheral nerve block, femoral nerve block. Excellent. Last 48 hours, patient don't complain of pain. Nowadays, there is a marking that is uh, can last for 72 hours. Liposomal extended release marking. If you give it into the hunter scanner where the saphenous nerve is, you patient get excellent pain relief. Can even walk on the next day itself or in the same day. Balance Energesia, NSA, Narcotic, Paracetamol, Lyrica. Basically, all this done to reduce the dependence on narcotics. Reduce the narcotic usage because they really warm it after operation. Physiotherapy, as soon as possible, bed exercise, bedside exercise, ambulation, walking aid, ice and elevation. Okay, a little bit of anticoagulation must give for 5 weeks because the risk of DVT is 30 to 60%. The risk of dying from pulmonary embolism is 1 in 1000. Aspirin has been shown to be equally cost effective compared to the newer anticoagulants like uh, low molecular weight uh, anticoagulants like Lexane or, or Factor 10A inhibitors like Zaroto. And of course, mechanical uh, techniques like DVT stocking, uh, nerve stimulator, mechanical pump must use. We use it often or in combination. Post operative care discharge as soon as patient is pain tolerable, wound is dry, patient can must be able to flex within 90. Uh, to 90 degree within 10 days, physiotherapy 3 to 6 months, some patients are lazy, I just ask them to do home therapy, they get equally good result. 
You can drive for the six weeks, stay climbing six weeks, all depend. Because the implant is well fixed, you can even run the next day, but because of the pain, you can't. Follow up two weeks, six weeks, three months, six months, first year. Then between second year to five years, you really no need to follow up because most of the failure does not occur in this period. Thereafter, yearly. Remember, the failure rate is 1% per year. So if I do a total knee today, 100 people, at 10 years, supposed to be 90% doing well. But actual registry shows 98% still doing well. At 20 years, it may drop to 94, 92. Okay? So we need to follow up because we want to look for failure. Possible complication, every patient will bleed 2 to 400 mils per knee. If I do two knees, I try my best not to transfuse, transcendamic acid, okay, pre and post-op. Neurovascular injury, 1 in 800 never happened to me, but I've seen happen to others. Intraoperative fracture, yes, never happened, but I've seen happen, major problem, but can be fixed. Patella maltracking is the commonest problem. During operation, after operation, may need revision if you can't tackle it. Instability is another problem, may need revision. Fat embolism from uh, cementing. First six weeks, the threaded complication infection, deep seated 1%. Anywhere in the world, even the center that does dedicated in knee arthroplasty, who does thousands of knee, they have 1% infection rate. If you are diabetic, your infection rate goes up to 2 to 5%. Wound breakdown, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolus, patella maltracking. Late long term complication, you can still get infection up to 2 years, 5 years from your dental abscess, dental caries. You can get stiffness, patellofemoral pain, periprosthetic fracture. I had one periprosthetic fracture during MCO. Thank God the implant wasn't loosened, so just fix the femur. Aseptic loosening from plastic wear, okay. Septic loosening, scar pain is another problem. Mid flexion instability will need revision. Poly dislocation and rotating platform. Rotating platform, if you don't balance your knee well, the, the plastic can just spin out, okay? Then you have to go and revise it and use a thicker plastic. Progenal, uh, chronic regional pain syndrome, metal allergy, polywear. So even if I do a perfectly looking total knee in 100 people, only 70 to 80 percent is satisfied. We don't know why the other 20 percent not satisfied. There are a lot of issues, scar pain, maybe there's slight mild rotation, maybe slight virus, vulgus, but generally, 70 to 80 percent patients are very happy, 20 percent not happy. Uh, but I just want to tell you, it's the ultimate cure for painful, deformed, stiff knee. Please send the patient early because this operation is really rewarding if it's done properly. Okay, a last talk, quality control in knee replacement. Some countries like UK and Scandinavian countries, they have a joint registry. National. That means whoever does knee replacement anywhere in the country, whether in a small hospital, big hospital, you have to enter the data. The implant data, which company, who is the surgeon. This is to track which implant is doing well at 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, because this implant can be recommended. And also surgeon factor, or oh, this surgeon got very high revision rate, so they can strike him off. Hospital, this hospital got very high infection rate, so they can act, okay. So this will improve clinical standards. So Malaysia should actually look at this. We don't have a national uh, registry. I think that's the future. Another thing is uh, get it right first time, give. That means the first operation is the most important. If the surgeon screw it up, the patient is going to end up with multiple operations. So we have to use a recommended implant. Don't simply use some implant from countries that have never been tested, less than 10 years old. Okay. So use an implant that has undergone more than 10 years, has got a lot of data, use it. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Dharma. We have received a um, few questions from our viewers today. Mm. First question, this is from Dr. Nagaratnam. Can both knees be replaced at the same time? And how soon can the patient mobilize after surgery, doctor? Okay, very good question. I do a lot of bilateral knee replacement. If the patient is healthy, no comorbidities like no diabetes, no heart disease, healthy patient, I think about maybe 20% of my knee replacements are bilateral in one sitting. Okay, but remember bilateral knee carries a higher morbidity. Number one, increased blood loss. Number two, increased risk of infection. Number three, increased risk of 
DVT and pulmonary embolism. But I still do it. Why? Because it's one single hospitalization, single time surgery, single anesthesia, single physiotherapy, and you can cut down the cost by about ten thousand ringgit in private setting. All right. So it is mm -hmm. quite common. We do a lot of bilateral things, but we choose the patient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Next one, doctor, is from Doctor Lo Yunhua. She uh, have a, a few questions. First one, uh, can we go swimming with the implants? Are the implants sensitive to outside temperature? No, you can go swimming, cycling, you can play tennis, you can go hiking. Everything you can do once the knee has settled. It takes three to six months before it settles remodeling of your bone cuts, your soft tissue. You can do whatever. The ideal knee replacement is for you to be active. That's why we do. You can do all that swim, cycle, tennis, golf, everything you can do except jumping and twisting. Okay. And um, any contradiction be besides poorly controlled diabetes and how long will implant last? Okay, whenever we do any surgery elective, we always balance the risk benefit. If the risk is higher than the benefit, we won't do. Let's say the patient has severe heart disease, all kinds of disease, and there's a risk of killing the patient during surgery, so we won't do. As long as the patient's benefit is higher than the risk, we'll do it, whether they're diabetic. But before we do the operation, we get the physician to optimize the condition, get everything under control, then we do it. Okay, last one, doctor. This is also from Dr. Lo Yunhua. How early is early to send patients? Uh, if you have tried everything, patients still in pain, and uh, I think it's time to send to me right. or anybody, any orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Dharma. Yeah. Uh, any last advice for the, our viewers today, doctor? Uh, actually, uh, knee replacement is very specialized surgery, but it's a very rewarding surgery. It's a very common. If you go to Western country, a lot of people get it done. But Asian patient, they always reluctant because they like to listen to a lot of uh, uh, outside advice. Uh, so please do consider and advise your patient to seek treatment for if they want to have a pain-free quality life. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, thank, thank you so much, Doctor Dharma, for the updates. I believe our viewers out there receive a lot of useful information from you through this session. Thank you once again. Okay. To all our viewers out there, we have another online CME session with our resident orthopedic spine surgeon and pain management specialist, Dr. Chua Yu Chi, on the topic of spine uh, frequent uh, asked questions are finally answered on next Friday, 4th of September at 6 p.m. Let me know if you are interested. Uh, we will share the link for you to join. And also, don't forget to scan the QR code at the end of this live by using your MMA doctor phone application to get your CPD point now. If you have any difficulties to scan the code, please click on the link in the comment section to confirm your attendance manually before 7.30 p.m. today. I will help to submit your attendance manually into the MMS system. Remember, before 7.30 p.m. today. So we have come to the end of our online CME today. Thank you everyone for watching us and see you next time.